So we're going to uh, continue again uh, this morning to look at the series that we've been looking at and cr critique the false doctrine known as Calvinism. We've been looking at what is known as the acronym uh, TULIP in Calvinistic doctrine. The TULIP acronym uh, is uh, known as the acrostic TULIP and uh, it's what many leading Calvinists such as John MacArthur uh, hold to to define uh, their doctrine. We're looking at uh, this book uh, here called The Five Points of Calvinism, defined, defended and documented by David N. Steele, Curtis C. Thomas and uh, Les, uh, sorry, S. Lance Quinn. And uh, as I've said before, I've chosen this book to refute because of the names uh, that give approval of this book and uh, such as John MacArthur and also uh, people on the back here. You've got J.I. Packer, R.C. Sproul. Uh, these are well-known uh, Calvinists. And uh, John MacArthur, he's had a large influence over many Bible-believing Christians due to his uh, lean towards conservative Christianity. He's done well uh, at times in calling out some of the modern methods and worldly ways that modern Christianity have wrongly uh, adopted into the church. Uh, and therefore, he's got an influence. He's an influence. And uh, especially to those who hold uh, to what he holds to in those areas and have similar views in those conservative type areas. But John MacArthur, uh, he also uh, holds to the false doctrine of Calvinism which in my opinion, it's no less important an issue as some of those issues that you might agree with him on. I've also chosen uh, this book uh, because of the names that the book recommends, as I've said. And uh, so, because you don't want to misre misrepresent something. You want to, because uh, you'll always be accused of that. You'll always be accused of misrepresenting something. Uh, so I think it's good to go through uh, the book and use the verses that they're using and look at those verses. Uh, leading Calvinists, such as the late R.C. Sproul and J.L. Packer, uh, they give high approval of this book. J.L. Packer says one could hardly wish for a better study resource to show the five points faithfulness to Scripture. That's what J.L. Packer says. R.C. Sproul says, truly a classic, clear, concise, and warm in its presentation of historic reformed theology, this latest edition is even better than the original. John MacArthur says, I'm thankful for this timely revision of wonderful, a classic that has already been an immense blessing to countless thousands, notwithstanding its success over the years. The only question that ultimately matters about the five points of Calvinism is whether these doctrines are biblical. This book, talking about this book, and that he says on page 139, he says, has demonstrated conclusively in my judgment that the five points are nothing more or less than what the Bible teaches. The doctrines of grace and divine sovereignty are the very lifeblood of the full and free salvation promised in the gospel. So the five points of Calvinism sit under the acrostic tulip. They are, they are according to this book, uh, it says they are T, stands for total depravity, or total inability. U stands for unconditional election. L stands for limited atonement. I stands for irresistible grace or the eff efficacious call of the spirit. <coughs> and P stands for perseverance of the saints or the security of the believers. So we looked at, we've looked at the uh, T in the acrostic already. We've done, uh, went, gone right through all the verses uh, under the, that the book uses under the acrostic of the T. So, and uh, what I believe we've found is they don't hold any water in regard to what they want them to say. So if anyone's missed any of those lessons, you can go online and have a look and uh, judge that for yourself. But uh, we're going to look at the second letter. Now, we're going to start to look at the second letter of the acrostic, which is the U in the tulip. Uh, which stands for unconditional election. 
So Calvinists teach that an unsaved or an unregenerated man is enslaved to his sinful nature due to the fall of Adam and therefore totally depraved. I agree with that. You don't have to be a Calvinist to agree with that. But they believe it in such a way that he is also unable to believe or receive the gospel. I disagree with that. So because of this supposed condition of being born unable to believe or receive the gospel, Calvinists then teach that God before the foundation of the world chose some people to be believers. And only these some are who God purposed to save. So what we need to understand is that Calvinists teach that those that he purposed to save out of the multitudes of the human race before the foundation of the world is unconditional. That's what they mean by unconditional election. It's unconditional. In Calvinism, people are not saved because they believe. They believe because they were determined in Calvinism uh, to be saved. On page 27 of the book, under the heading Unconditional Election, it says the doctrine of election declares that God, before the foundation of the world, chose certain individuals from among fallen members of Adam's race to be the objects of his undeserved favour. These and these only he purposed to save. He chose to save some and to exclude others. Those who were not chosen for salvation were passed by and left to their own evil devices and choices. But if you think about that statement, see, when we were looking at the Calvinist's total inability, the book tells us on page 19 that he, Adam, thereby plunged himself and the entire race into the spiritual ruin and, lo and lost for himself and his descendants the ability to make right choices in the spiritual realm. So now under the heading unconditional election, when we see a statement that says Adam's descendants are left to their own evil devices and choices, the fact that they don't make the right choice to believe under Calvinism is because they can't. They can't make the right choice to believe because the book, as the book says, they lost that ability according to Calvinism. Because it almost sounds justifiable, doesn't it? You know, if you kind of just throw that in there. You know, that they were left to their own de devices and, e and, and evil choices. But if they can't, if they can't believe, that doesn't really make sense, does it? So this is why Calvinism is such a controversial doctrine, because of its implications. And uh, this is why it needs to be called out. It needs to be called out as a false doctrine. On page 96 of the book, Arthur Pink uh, has a book. So on page 96 uh, of this book, uh, they recommend for further reading a book by Arthur Pink called The Sovereignty of God. So if they recommend it, then let's read an excerpt from Arthur Pink's book. We'll read a section from Arthur Pink's book. So in chapter 4, under the heading, The Sovereignty of God in Reprobation, Arthur Pink writes, in the, Westminster, in the Westminster Confession, it is said, God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably foreordain whatsoever comes to pass. He goes on to say, the late Mr. F. W. Grant, a most careful and cautious student and writer commenting on these words said, it is perfectly divinely true that God hath ordained for his own glory whatsoever comes to pass. He goes on to say, now if these statements are true, is not the doctrine of reprobation established by them? What in human history is the one thing which does come to pass every day? What but that men and women die, pass out of this world into a hopeless eternity, an eternity of suffering and woe, if then God has foreordained whatsoever comes to pass, then he must have decreed that vast numbers of human beings should pass out of this world unsaved to suffer eternally in the lake of fire. Admitting the general premise is not the, spe is not the specific conclusion inevitable. So you can see here that Arthur Pink sees the inevitable conclusion because if you look in this book, you won't see the conclusion written like that. But they recommend his book for further reading. They've got him on the back here as recommending this book. Uh, they've got 
inside the, inside the book, They've, they actually uh, recommend to read the sovereignty of God. That's what we just read, read from. See, what happens in uh, books like this one is, uh, that we're looking at, they leave out some things to make their doctrine seem more kind of palatable, you know, sound uh, nicer. You know, sometimes you've got to go to the books that they highly recommend in order to get some more information. And uh, see, what Arthur Pink described here is called or known as Calvinism's double predestination. He's just stating the obvious conclusion plainly. The conclusion is that if God, before the foundation of the world, decreed and foreordained that only some would be saved and to have a home in heaven, then it must conclude that God also decreed for others, the others remaining, that they would be unsaved and destined to suffer eternally in a lake of fire. All this determined for each individual before the foundation of the world. So he just comes straight out with it. But you won't see that in this book. They just recommend a book that does say it. Now, because you won't, if you won't find it stated that plainly in this book. But the problem I have is, if that's such a heresy, why do they recommend that book? Why, why would they say, don't go near that one? But they don't. See, I believe they just let people come to their own conclusions in that area. See, they all so highly recommend John Calvin's writings on this subject as well. John Calvin, Institutes for the Christian Religion, Book 3, Chapter 21, Paragraph 7, 7 says, I quote, he says, We say that God once established by his eternal and unchangeable plan those whom he long before determined once for all to receive unto salvation and, and those whom, on the other hand, he would devote to, dis to destruction. He has barred the door of life to those whom he has given over to damnation. That's, they recommend uh, Calvin's writings. So in Calvinism, you believe because God before the foundation of the world predetermined and chose you to be a believer. And if you are an, if you are an unbeliever, or if you die an unbeliever, it's because God also before the foundation of the world predetermined and chose you to be an unbeliever. According to J.I. Packer and John Calvin, uh, people that this, the people in this book, John MacArthur, and gives his approval of this book. I mean, he shouldn't have given his approval of this book if he doesn't believe that, but he does. Because someone might say, hey, they don't quite say it like that in that book. You know, especially choosing some to be unbelievers. I agree, they don't say it in this book. But why are they highly recommending other books and other Calvinists that do say that very plainly, as we just looked at. So let's look at the you being unconditional election. Uh, in, the book, in the book we have uh, five subheadings uh, under the main heading of unconditional election. The five subheadings are a chosen people. It's the first one. The second one is election not based on foreseen responses. The third one is election precedes salvation. Number four is sovereign mercy. Number five is sovereignty over all things. So we're going to be looking at all the verses uh, used under these subheadings to see whether they say or even imply that only some people have been unconditionally elected to be believers before the foundation of the world. See, the first subheading is a chosen people. <coughs> so on page 29, uh, has everyone got one of these printouts? Everyone's got one? It's good to even look it up in your Bible as well. That way you can sort of see the context surrounding those verses as well as looking at it on the paper. This paper is just for your reference. You can go back, take it home and look at these things later. But good to look them up in your Bible and, and see the, ref, the, the um, uh, surrounding verses as well. Uh, but we're going to look at all the verses they use and see if they hold any water in regard to the you and the tulip, unconditional election. So first, uh, we see a statement in this book uh, under the heading of chosen people. And the book states there are general statements in Scripture that God has an elect people that he, has, that he predestined them to salvation and thus to eternal life. So the, the statement in the book under the heading states that the following verses, quote, 
are general statements. General statements in scripture that God has an elect people that he predestined them to salvation and thus to eternal life. So that's what we're going to look at. Do any of the verses used under the heading a chosen people, which sits under unconditional election, say that God was choosing only some for salvation to the exclusion of others before the foundation of the world? I can understand why they say these verses are general statements in Scripture, general statements. They have to say that because I don't believe any of them actually say what the Calvinist wants, wants them to say that they use. The first verse used is Deuteronomy uh, chapter 10, verse 14 to 15, which says, Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's, thy God. The earth also, with all that therein is, only the Lord had... Only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all people, as it is this day. So this uh, verse is a declaration by Moses uh, to the chosen people of Israel. It's the chosen people of Israel. But to use this verse and apply it in the context of Calvinism's unconditional election which is why, where they've got it here, accompanied with the opening statement on page 29, would be, to, would be to imply that all these Israelites and every other Israelite that would come after them are chosen for salvation. The context in the verse do not say or imply this at all. Chosen to be an Israelite does not mean chosen to be saved. So even many Calvinists know that the Bible teaches that just because you are a chosen Israelite, according to the flesh, does not mean that you are saved. So using this verse in light of Calvinism's claims under the heading unconditional election would imply that every Israelite was unconditionally elected to be saved before the foundation of the world. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 10, Verses 1 to 4, he says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, uh, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. <coughs> So even if you're an Israelite, you still have to believe to be saved. Deuteronomy 10, 14 to 15 does not state or imply at all that God was unconditionally choosing some for salvation before the foundation of the world. It just doesn't. So the next verse they use uh, in the book is Psalm 33, 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his inheritance. So the verse uh, here it's, it's, uh, has the uh, Lord praising the nation whose God is the Lord. The verse in its context does not imply that God has unconditionally chosen the nation for his own inheritance. The condition is stated plainly in the same chapter just six verses later. It states Psalm 33, same chapter, verses 18 to 22 behold the eye of the lord is upon them that fear him that's the condition you must fear god upon them that hope in his mercy there's another condition to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine our soul waiteth for the lord he is our help and our shield for our heart shall rejoice in him look at this because we have trusted in his holy name not because of unconditional election as the Calvinists impose on this passage or especially in that verse verse 22 let thy mercy O Lord be upon us according as we hope in thee there's the condition the next verse used that they use in this book is Psalm 65 4 blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee that he may dwell in thy courts we shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even thy holy temple. So this verse does not say that God unconditionally elects or randomly chooses only some people before the foundation of the world to approach him. 
and to dwell in his courts. See, just because uh, this particular verse does not mention or a condition for being chosen to approach the Lord doesn't mean that there is no condition. You have to understand that. But the condition can be found in a lot of other passages and verses, as we just read. But here's another one. Fifth, uh, Psalm 15, 1 to 2 says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Well, there's the condition. Psalm 61, 4 to 5 says, I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. Selah. For thou, O God, hast heard my vows, thou hast given me uh, the heritage of those that fear thy name. There's the condition. See, the condition is to fear God. Those that fear God are those that God chooses to approach him. Psalm 65, 4 does not state or imply at all that God has unconditionally elected only some for salvation before the foundation of the world. The next verse they use in this book is Psalm 106, 5. That I may see the good of thy chosen, that I may rejoice in the gladness of thy nation, that I may glory with thine inheritance. See, unconditional election uh, is imposed upon this verse as well. See, the condition is found in verse 3. So from verse 1, Psalm 106, we read, uh, from verse 106, 1 to 5, Praise ye the Lord, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can show forth all his praise? Now think about this. Is it the unconditionally elected ones before the foundation of the world? Is, right? Is, is it them? No. Look at verse 3. Blessed are they that keep judgment and he that doeth righteousness at all times. Verse 4. Remember me, O Lord, with the, with the favour that thou bearest unto thy people. O visit me with thy salvation, that I may see the good of thy chosen, that I may rejoice in the gladness of thy nation, that I may glory with thine inheritance. So Psalm 106.5 does not say or imply that God has unconditionally before the foundation of the world determined to save only some people. See, context always kills Calvinism. Context always kills it. The next verse that they use is Haggai 2.23. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of uh, Sheltiel, saith the Lord, and shall make thee a signet, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. So chosen thee for what? Chosen thee for what? That's what you need to ask. Chosen thee for what? That's the question. See, Zerubbabel was already a, a saved man. He was chosen by God to be a signet. The verse does not say that he was unconditionally elected or chosen by God before the foundation of the world to be saved. That's just, the verse doesn't say that, nor does it even imply that. The next verse used is Matthew 11, uh, verse 27. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. So in the context of the passage, Jesus is not stating that he only reveals the Father to people who are unconditionally elected or chosen before the foundation of the world to be saved. That's not the context of the passage. The verse does not say that, nor does it imply that at all. The context of the passage is Jesus stating his authority and his oneness with the Father, which the Jews that he's talking to are rejecting. He's stating that these Jews don't know the Father because they refuse to know Jesus for who, who he is. That's, that's the context. They must come to Jesus now to have the Father revealed unto them. That's what he's saying. And Jesus will reveal, reveal the Father to those that come to him. That's the context of the passage. The invitation is to all that will come to him. That's the condition. 
That's why we read in the very next verse, Matthew 11, 28 to 30, Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, this is just another example uh, of Calvinists reading unconditional election for salvation only to some over the top of Scripture. See, they pluck that verse 27 out of context and uh, impose all their theology on top of it when the scripture does not say it at all. The next verse used or abused I should say is Matthew 22 14. See this, this one's a Calvinist favourite. For many are called but few are chosen. <coughs> so the question you need to ask is why were they chosen? Is it unconditional? Because this, is, this verse is used under the heading unconditional election. Unconditionally electing or saving people to be saved before the foundation of the world. So you've got to ask the question, many are called but few are chosen. The question is why are they chosen? See, Jesus had just given the parable of the wedding feast. The people that were chosen to attend were the people that accepted the invitation. The people that rejected the invitation are likened to ones that were invited or called but rejected the offer. And uh, that was the majority in Israel in this case. That was the majority of Israel. That's why he's telling the parable. Then the, then the servants were told to go out into the highways and bid as many as they could. The ones that accepted were chosen to attend. Therefore, many are called, but few are chosen. The verse does not say, nor does it imply, that God unconditionally elected or chose only some people to be saved before the foundation of the world. <laughs> How can you get that? See, context, again, always kills Calvinism. The next verse used, uh, verse is used, uh, Matthew 24, uh, verses 22 verses 24 and 31. I've put them down on the uh, little piece of paper, uh, how they put it in the book. Um, they've placed these verses together with little dots between uh, these verses. <coughs> uh, I'm guessing to pick up on the main points that they want to uh, say in this book uh, to try and get across. But um, we'll put, them, put all the verses up here so we can see them all. Uh, but the way they, they say it in the book, and except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Uh, then they go on to verse 22, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of, trump, of a trumpet, and they shall gather the, his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So the context of uh, the passage is the signs of the ends of the age. And uh, just because the verses say elect doesn't mean the elect were people chosen or can't unconditionally elected to be saved before the foundation of the world. Nor does the passage say or even imply that anywhere here in this passage. The elect ones are simply those who have trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. Or simply the ones that were chosen to attend the wedding in the context of the previous verses that we just looked at. Being them that accepted the invitation. The problem that Calvinists have is that whenever they see this word elect, they apply unconditional election for salvation before the foundation of the world. Because that's just how the template that they have put over the scripture whenever they see that word. The next verse used is Luke 18, 7. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? Again, this verse only states that God will avenge his elect. That's all it says. 
It says nothing of who and how one becomes the elect of God. It doesn't say that anywhere in the verse. Or, or it doesn't even say that election is unconditional. They've just used that verse, I guess, because it says elect. The next passage uh, used is Romans 8, 28 <coughs> to 30. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he, and whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. The question uh, that you need to ask is, who is called according to his purpose? Who? Who is called according to his purpose in this passage? So is it just some out of multitudes that were just unconditionally elected or chosen before the foundation of the world to be saved? Because that's what the Calvinist is putting over this passage. No. Because we see it there in verse 29. It is them that love God. They are who are called according to his purpose. That's the condition. That is the condition. God purposed to save them that love him. And this was God's purpose that was purposed in Christ before the world began. The condition to receive the spiritual blessings found only in Christ is that you must love God and trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. And therefore, to, uh, to be found in him. That's how you are found in Christ. And uh, we're going to come back and look at this passage a little closer in the next lesson. Um, and we'll deal a bit more with that passage. See, so it's the believer's inheritance that has been predestined in Christ before the foundation of the world. It's the believer's inheritance. Nowhere in the Bible do we see random people being unconditionally predestined or elected to be believers before the foundation of the world. You just can't find that in the Bible. Because that's what they're using all these verses to say. That's what they're using under uh, a chosen people, which is under the main heading unconditional election. Ephesians 1.11 verse 12 says this, In whom also we... Who's we? Believers have obtained an inheritance. Look at this. Being predestinated. What, what's being predestinated? What's that? An inheritance. Being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. That we... Who's we? Believers should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. So you must first trust Christ to receive the inheritance that was predestined in Christ before the world began. It is a revealed purpose and a revealed mystery found in Christ before the foundation of the world for all that would believe. Them that love God in any age were predestined to be justified and glorified, they are called by the gospel, justified by the gospel, and glorified by the gospel. It is a revealed plan of salvation through the gospel, which is conditioned on if you are in Christ through faith. That's what it is. See, Ephesians 3, 3 to 6, the Apostle Paul writes, whereby when you read, you may understand in my knowledge, uh, so my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. <clears throat> which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, look at this, that the Gentiles shall be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by unconditional election. Doesn't say that, does it? This is the gospel. They are partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. 
Romans 8, 28 to 30 does not say, nor does it imply that God was unconditionally electing or choosing only some to be saved before the foundation of the world for unrevealed reasons. It just does not say that. The next verse that they use is Romans 8, 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. That's true. It is God that justifieth his elect. It is. But nowhere in this verse does it say that God elected only sons to be believers before they were born for un uh, by unconditionally electing them to salvation. It just doesn't say it in there. The condition to be part of the elect is always faith in Christ. It's not unconditional. To be justified is always conditioned on whether you believe. See, Romans 3, verse 30 says, Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumc uncircumcision through faith. The Bible's so clear on that. The next verse that they use is Romans 11, verse 28. <coughs> As concerning the gospel, uh, they are enemies for your sakes. This is talking about Israel. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. So in this verse, it's talking about the nation of Israel, of Israel being the elect of God. See, God elects things. He elected uh, the, uh, the Israelites uh, to be a people to fulfill these purposes. That doesn't mean that they're all chosen for salvation or unconditionally elected or chosen to be saved before the foundation of the world. The context of the verse does not allow for that, nor does it say that. The next verse that they use is Colossians 3, verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. See, believers are called the elect of God because they are in Christ. And Christ is the elected one. See, the verse does not say anything about being chosen or unconditionally elected before the foundation of the world for salvation. It doesn't say it there. The next verse that they use is 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. <coughs> for God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So our destination as believers has been appointed. That's all this verse says. Yes, it was even appointed before the foundation of the world. The us in this verse is simply believers. It has been appointed by God that believers will obtain salvation and not the wrath of God. That's all this verse is saying. It does not say, nor does it imply at all, that God was unconditionally elected or electing or chose only that some would be saved before the foundation of the world. It doesn't say it. The next verse used is Titus 1 verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. Again, believers are called the elect of God because they are in Christ, the elected one. The verse does not say anything about being chosen or unconditionally elected before the foundation of the world for salvation. Just another e example of the Calvinists seeing that word elect and then uh, implying or applying all their false doctrine over the top of it. The next verse used, uh, verses used is 1 Peter 1, uh, verses 1 to 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. <coughs> Again, believers are called the elect. Here they are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So foreknowledge here isn't God merely just looking uh, forward through the passages of time to see which individual would accept him. And uh, we're going to deal with that under the next uh, uh, subheading in the book, uh, which is called election, not based on foreseen responses. See, the, fore the foreknowledge of God the Father encompasses his whole plan of salvation. 
in which those who would accept his son would be saved and therefore are called the elect. See, if you are in the elect one, being in Christ, then you are also called the elect. But the condition for being in Christ is always faith. Always. God in his foreknowledge declared this to be the case. He declared this to be the case. Ephesians 2, 7 and 9 sums up the foreknowledge of God uh, and his redemptive plan in salvation. Verse 7, in Ephesians 2, verse 7, says that in the ages <coughs> excuse me, to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's why John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, because that was always God's plan right from the beginning. 1 Peter 1 verse, uh, verses 1 to 2 does not say or imply at all that God has unconditionally elected only some to be saved. The condition that God determined is faith. The next verse, uh, verses used, are 1 Peter uh, 2 verses 8 and 9. A stone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. So the verse, well the verses here simply state that believers in Christ are a chosen generation that have been called out of darkness into his marvellous light. They were called out through the gospel and placed in Christ when they believed. It does not say that individuals were called out to be believers or chosen or unconditionally elected to be saved before the foundation of the world. The passage or the verses don't say that. So the next and the final verse used under the subheading, A Chosen People, uh, which is the subheading under unconditional election, is Revelation 17.4. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So the context here is the second coming uh, of Jesus Christ. Those uh, that are with him are all the saved. They are, they are all the called and chosen and the faithful. But they're just like the ones that accepted the invitation to the wedding in Matthew chapter 22. That's who he's talking about here. They still had to accept the offer of salvation. They were called to attend. They accepted the invitation. They were then chosen to be there. The verse here in Revelation 17, 4 says nothing about being chosen or unconditionally elected out of multitudes before the foundation of the world for salvation doesn't say it. So in my opinion, it appears that whenever the writers of uh, the book here, the five points of Calvinism, defined, defended and documented, see the word elect, or the word chosen, they automatically attach the thought and meaning of unconditionally elected to be saved before the foundation of the world. But not one of the verses that we just looked at under the heading of chosen people say or apply or, or imply that in my opinion. So next lesson we're going to look at the second subheading under unconditional election which is called election not based on foreseen, on foreseen responses. And I agree with that. I think they're even coming at it the wrong angle and uh, we're going to look at all that next week. Um, so we'll just finish up there, we'll just uh, commit it to, again to the Lord in prayer and finish up.